Fourth turning point. Because I was my wife's husband and her people had influence, I secured the appointment as assistant to the chief counsel for one of the largest coal companies in the world. My salary was greatly out of proportion to those usually paid to beginners, and still further out of proportion to what I was worth. But pull was pull, and I was there just the same. It happened that what I lacked in legal skill I more than made up through the application of the principle of performing more service than that for which I was paid, and by taking the initiative and doing that which should have been done without being told to do it. I was holding my position without difficulty. I practically had a soft berth for life had I cared to keep it. Without consultation with my friends and without warning, I resigned. This was the first turning point that was of my own selection. It was not forced upon me. I saw the old man fate coming and beat him to the door. When pressed for a reason for resigning, I gave what seemed to me to be a very sound one, but I had trouble convincing the family circle that I had acted wisely. I quit that position because the work was too easy and I was performing it with too little effort. I saw myself drifting into the habit of inertia. I felt myself becoming accustomed to taking life easily, and I knew that the next step would be retrogression. I had so many friends at court that there was no particular impelling urge that made it necessary for me to keep moving. I was among friends and relatives, and I had a position that I could keep as long as I wished it, without exerting myself. I received an income that provided me with all the necessities and some of the luxuries, including a motor car and enough gasoline to keep it running. What more did I need? Nothing, I was beginning to say to myself. This was the attitude toward which I felt myself slipping. It was an attitude which, for some reason that is still unknown to me, startled me so sharply that I made what many believed to be an irrational move by resigning. However ignorant I might have been in other matters at the time, I have felt thankful ever since for having had sense enough to realize that strength and growth come only through continuous effort and struggle that disuse brings atrophy and decay. This move proved to be the next most important turning point in my life, although it was followed by ten years of effort which brought almost every conceivable grief that the human heart can experience. I quit my job in the legal field, where I was getting along well, living among friends and relatives, where I had what they believed to be an unusually bright and promising future ahead of me. I am frank to admit that it has been an ever-increasing source of wonderment to me as to why and how I gathered the courage to make the move that I did. As far as I am able to interpret the event, I arrived at my decision to resign more because of a hunch or a sort of prompting which I then did not understand than by logical reasoning. I selected Chicago as my new field of endeavor. I did this because I believed Chicago to be a place where one might find out if one had those sterner qualities which are so essential for survival in a world of keen competition. I made up my mind that if I could gain recognition in any honorable sort of work in Chicago, it would prove that I had the sort of material in my makeup that might be developed into real ability. That was a queer process of reasoning. At least it was an unusual process for me to indulge in at that time which reminds me to state that we human beings often take unto ourselves credit for intelligence to which we are not entitled. I fear we too often assume credit for wisdom and for results that accrue from causes over which we have absolutely no control. While I do not mean to convey the impression that I believe all of our acts to be controlled by causes beyond our power to direct, yet I strongly urge you to study and correctly interpret those causes which mark the most vital turning points of your life the points at which your efforts are diverted from the old into new channels, in spite of all that you can do. At least refrain from accepting any defeat as failure until you shall have had time to analyze the final result. My first position in Chicago was that of advertising manager of a large correspondence school. I knew but little about advertising, but my previous experience as a salesman, plus the advantage gained by rendering more service than that for which I was paid, enabled me to make an unusual showing. The first year I earned $5,200. I was coming back by leaps and bounds. Gradually the rainbow's end began to circle around me, and I saw, once more, the shining pot of gold almost within my reach. History is full of evidence that a feast usually precedes a famine. 
I was enjoying a feast, but did not anticipate the famine that was to follow. I was getting along so well that I thoroughly approved of myself. Self-approval is a dangerous state of mind. This is a great truth which many people do not learn until the softening hand of time has rested upon their shoulders for the better part of a lifetime. Some never do learn it, and those who do are those who finally begin to understand the dumb language of defeat. I am convinced that one has but few, if any, more dangerous enemies to combat than that of self-approval. Personally, I fear it more than defeat. This brings me to my fifth turning point, which was also of my own choice. Fifth Turning Point I had made such a good record as advertising manager of the correspondence school that the president of the school induced me to resign my position and go into the candy manufacturing business with him. We organized the Betsy Ross Candy Company, and I became its first president, thus beginning the most important turning point of my life. The business grew rapidly until we had a chain of stores in eighteen different cities. Again I saw my rainbow's end almost within my reach. I knew that I had at last found the business in which I wished to remain for life. The candy business was profitable, and because I looked upon money as being the only evidence of success, I naturally believed I was about to corner success. Everything went smoothly until my business associate and a third man, whom we had taken into the business, took a notion to gain control of my interest in the business without paying for it. Their plan was successful in a way, but I balked more stiffly than they had anticipated I would. Therefore, for the purpose of gentle persuasion, they had me arrested on a false charge and then offered to withdraw the charge on condition that I turn over to them my interest in the business. I had commenced to learn for the first time that there was much cruelty and injustice and dishonesty in the hearts of men. When the time for a preliminary hearing came, the complaining witnesses were nowhere to be found but I had them brought and forced them to go on the witness stand and tell their stories, which resulted in my vindication and a damage suit against the perpetrators of the injustice. This incident brought about an irreparable breach between my business associates and myself, which finally cost me my interest in the business, but that was but slight when compared to that which it cost my associates, for they are still paying and no doubt will continue to pay as long as they live. My damage suit was brought under what is known as a tort action, through which damages were claimed for malicious damage to character. In Illinois, where the action was brought, judgment under a tort action gives the one in favor of whom the judgment is rendered the right to have the person against whom it is obtained placed in jail until the amount of the judgment has been paid. In due time, I got a heavy judgment against my former business associates. I could then have had both of them placed behind the bars. For the first time in my life I was brought face to face with the opportunity to strike back at my enemies in a manner that would hurt. I had in my possession a weapon with teeth in it, a weapon placed there by the enemies themselves. The feeling that swept over me was a queer one. Would I have my enemies jailed, or would I take advantage of this opportunity to extend them mercy, thereby proving myself to be made of a different type of material? Then and there was laid in my heart the foundation upon which the sixteenth lesson of this course is built, for I made up my mind to permit my enemies to go free, as free as they could be made by my having extended them mercy and forgiveness. But long before my decision had been reached, the hand of fate had commenced to deal roughly with these misguided fellow-men who had tried in vain to destroy me. Time, the master worker, to which we must all submit sooner or later, had already been at work on my former business associates, and it had dealt with them less mercifully than I had done. One of them was later sentenced to a long term in the penitentiary for another crime that he had committed against some other person, and the other one had, meanwhile, been reduced to pauperism. We can circumvent the laws which men place upon statute books, but the law of compensation never. The judgment which I obtained against these men stands on the records of the Superior Court of Chicago as silent evidence of vindication of my character. But it serves me in a more important way than that. It serves as a reminder that I could forgive enemies who had tried to destroy me, and for this reason, instead of destroying my character, I suspect that the incident served to strengthen it. Being arrested seemed at the time a terrible disgrace, even though the charge was false. 
I did not relish the experience, and I would not wish to go through a similar experience again. But I am bound to admit that it was worth all the grief it cost me, because it gave me the opportunity to find out that revenge was not a part of my makeup. Here I would direct your attention to a close analysis of the events described in this lesson, for if you observe carefully, you can see how this entire course of study has been evolved out of these experiences. Each temporary defeat left its mark upon my heart and provided some part of the material of which this course has been built. We would cease to fear or to run away from trying experiences if we observed, from the biographies of men of destiny, that nearly every one of them was sorely tried and run through the mill of merciless experience before he arrived. This leads me to wonder if the band of fate does not test the metal of which we are made in various and sundry ways before placing great responsibilities upon our shoulders. Before approaching the next turning point of my life, may I not call your attention to the significant fact that each turning point carried me nearer and nearer my rainbow's end, and brought me some useful knowledge which became later a permanent part of my philosophy of life. Sixth Turning Point we come now to the turning point which probably brought me nearer the rainbow's end than any of the others had, because it placed me in a position where I found it necessary to bring into use all the knowledge I had acquired up to that time, concerning practically every subject with which I was acquainted, and gave me opportunity for self-expression and development such as rarely comes to a man so early in life. This turning point came shortly after my dreams of success in the candy business had been shattered, when I turned my efforts to teaching advertising and salesmanship as a department of one of the colleges of the Middle West. Some wise philosopher has said that we never learn very much about a given subject until we commence teaching it to others. My first experience as a teacher proved this to be true. My school prospered from the very beginning. I had a resident class and also a correspondence school through which I was teaching students in nearly every English-speaking country. Despite the ravages of war, the school was growing rapidly, and I again saw the end of the rainbow within sight. Then came the second military draft, which practically destroyed my school, as it caught most of those who were enrolled as students. At one stroke I charged off more than $75,000 in tuition fees, and at the same time contributed my own service to my country. Once more I was penniless. Unfortunate is the person who has never had the thrill of being penniless at one time or another, for, as Edward Bach has truthfully stated, poverty is the richest experience that can come to a man, an experience which, however, he advises one to get away from as quickly as possible. Again, I was forced to redirect my efforts, but before I proceed to describe the next and last important turning point, I wish to call your attention to the fact that no single event described up to this point is, within itself, of any practical significance. The six turning points that I have briefly described meant nothing to me taken singly, and they will mean nothing to you if analyzed singly. But take these events collectively, and they form a very significant foundation for the next turning point, and constitute reliable evidence that we human beings are constantly undergoing evolutionary changes as a result of the experiences of life with which we meet even though no single experience may seem to convey a definite, usable lesson. I feel impelled to dwell at length on the point which I am here trying to make clear, because I have now reached the point in my career at which men go down in permanent defeat or rise with renewed energies to heights of attainment of stupendous proportions, according to the manner in which they interpret their past experiences and use those experiences as the basis of working plans. If my story stopped here, it would be of no value to you. But there is another and a more significant chapter yet to be written, covering the seventh and most important of all the turning points of my life. It must have been obvious to you, all through my description of the six turning points already outlined, that I had not really found my place in the world. It must have been obvious to you that most, if not all, of my temporary defeats were due mainly to the fact that I had not yet discovered the work into which I could throw my heart and soul. Finding the work for which one is best fitted and which one likes best is very much like finding the one person whom one loves best. There is no rule by which to make the search, but when the right niche is contacted, one immediately recognizes it.